Strange from the Other Side of Cinema. I'm Mark Dickerson. And I'm Jeremy Fink. And we are now at episode 9, which is the beginning of a new series here at Cult Movie Cult. And this one's called Rock and Reel, Cult Music Films of the 60s and 70s. We're going to begin our Rock and Reel series with Hard Day's Night, directed by Richard Lester. Tell me, uh, how did you find America? So I left to Greenland. Has success changed your life? Yes. I'd like to keep Britain tidy. Are you a mod or a rocker? Um, no, I'm a mocker. Oh. <laughs> Have you any hobbies? No, actually, we're just good friends. Do you think these haircuts have come to stay? Well, this one has, you know. It's stuck on good and proper now. <laughs> Frankly nice. Uh, what would you call that uh, hairstyle you're wearing? Arthur. No, actually, we're just good friends. You're the brown, aren't they? What do you call that collar? Oh, um, a collar. Oh, do you often see your father? No, actually, we're just good friends. 1964's Hard Day's Night is a film that follows the Beatles after the release of their uh, third album, their third studio album, I believe, Hard Day's Night. Uh, it tracks them as they try to go from a train to a televised gig uh, in London, um, and it basically just follows the shenanigans of this young band that's deep uh, in the throes of Beatlemania, right, when yes. it was first coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really from that first moment, which is, which is now iconic, uh, really you immediately just get how insane and wild it must have been at the time to be part of or witness that. Sure. Yeah, you're really thrust right into Beatlemania, like you said. Um, And for the series that we're doing right now, um, we try to look at films from musicians of the time period, 60s and 70s, that are about the music in some way, like about being a musician. Um, And uh, for this one, yeah, we're we're focusing particularly on rock and roll for this series. And of course, it may seem strange to hear the word Colt and the Beatles in the same uh, breath, but... You know, although we're discussing an acclaimed film from one of the, you know, biggest bands ever, uh, I feel like this movie does very much have the look and feel of a cult film. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's full of zany, madcap situations, non sequiturs, uh, numerous amounts of quotable lines, memorable moments, stuff like that. And that camera work too. Yeah, the camera. I mean, the 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 black and white photography is is amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, it's also very experimental, though. Uh, yes. uh, they, they did a lot of things in this movie. One in particular that I'm thinking of is um, there's there's one part where the band is being interviewed. Uh, they're, they're doing some yeah. kind of little little press junket and they're being photographed. And uh, I, I think it's George, I want to say, is the one being photographed. But rather than just showing quick snapshots, we actually see a contact sheet show up on the screen yeah. um, kind of row by row, which is really innovative. The, the end credits of this film have this really beautiful sequence, which I'm hoping to find a way to steal at some point, where oh, yeah, there, <laughs> like, uh, there, there are these really quick dissolves using still photographs. The camera kind of whips around all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this is really a very influential film outside of just music filmmaking, too. Right. Um, I, I know I've heard Martin Scorsese uh, reference this film. A, a lot of those big, uh, you know, kind of 70s new Hollywood guys, you know, Scorsese, De Palma, Spielberg, all those guys... Um, you hear them talking, a lot of them talk about, oh, I just wanted to make a Richard Lester film, you know, the way they mm-hmm. zip that camera around and it's very playful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, a lot of, yeah. a lot of innovative stuff. It's a very artfully made uh, film and, you know, it's basically an imagined day in the life of perhaps one of the most popular bands in the world. Well, I think we could say the probably the most popular band in the world, mm-hmm. uh, the Beatles. So, um, especially at that time, no doubt. Especially at that time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's the play of the different aspects of the film, like the silliness and at the at times, like you said, surrealistic scenes um, that I think make it a cult film. Uh, mm-hmm. And you actually have lots of, uh, you know, you have some background with this film. You were telling me a little bit about it before we started recording. And you've actually just been on a Beatles kick. So yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> curious to get, you know, I guess like your first impressions of the film. Well, so what's interesting is when I say I've been on a Beatles kick, so I, I, I've been a pretty big Beatles fan my whole life because my father was a massive Beatles fan. And I was actually, I was talking to Mark before we began this, telling him that I, I, I hadn't seen this film in probably 10 or 15 years, but it felt like an old friend. You know, it just, it just mm-hmm. felt like something that I knew for some reason. I knew every part of uh, all the images seemed really familiar and it's just kind of so deeply ingrained 
you know, into my psyche personally, because it was always on, you know, television when I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but my, my obsession with the Beatles tends to actually be more focused on late Beatles, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the White Album, Let It Be, Magical Mystery Tour, th- those kind of albums, mm-hmm. the, the more experimental wild stuff. Um, so it was really eye-opening uh, seeing this because, like, quite frankly, I- I'm not always a huge fan of early Beatles. Um, but seeing this movie actually made me appreciate um, the music more, which is ultimately, I-, I think, the point of the film and why they made it in the first place. Um, I-, I was reading it, and it's it seemed like the goal originally was just... I don't know if exploitation film is the right word, but it was basically just a way to help them sell records. They didn't really have any intentions of it becoming, you know, mm-hmm. the thing that it became, which is innovative because it's kind of like an early music video, mm-hmm. um, just feature length. And I'm sure that's what the studio execs expected when they came to the Beatles and said, hey, we want you to make a, a film. They probably assumed it was going to be, uh, you know, well, this was before music videos, but pretty much a promotional music video type of a thing. And uh, what they got was very much not that, <laughs> no. which is another, another reason I feel like it's a cult film as well. Yeah. I mean, the music is just worked in kind mm-hmm. of so like, like, like the, haphazardly. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like it's just kind of weaved in and the story, like that. I mean, there are honestly times, like I love the songs where throughout the movie, like they would start singing and I would be like, Oh, I, I kind of want to see where the, the plot goes. Um, but you know, but it is also so interesting just the way that the music was kind of um, put in the forefront, even in scenes where it wasn't just them playing, um, which, which, like I said, like the Scorsese influence, like if you watch Mean Streets, uh, I'm thinking very specifically about the one scene where uh, uh, the De Niro character walks in. Have, have you seen Mean Streets, Mark? Yes, I have. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's the one scene where uh, Robert De Niro's character walks into a bar and it's very famous and it's slow motion. And I think, uh, what's the song? It's a Rolling Stone song playing. I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. I can't remember either. I want to say like Jumping Jack Flash or something like mm-hmm. that. But just the way the music came to the the forefront of the moment and like it really carried the moment uh, was something that personally I would probably point to Hard Day's Night and say mm-hmm. say that it really started the way, there, the way Richard Lester would just let the music carry a moment uh, instead of the moment just having music in the background, mm-hmm. you know, like a, a pop song. Yeah, it, he made it more interesting that way, the way he presented each song. Um, and the Beatles themselves, uh, obviously, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, not that they really need introductions. Uh, but I'm, they actually did have a lot of input into what was going on. It was very much a collaboration between them and the director, uh, Richard Lester. And uh, that's what makes it so easygoing, I think, and what makes it so... It, the whole movie feels almost off the cuff, even though it is very scripted, obviously, um, yeah. but it just you know the the lightheartedness, the playfulness of it. Um, I think that's what makes it all work. And then of course we have the uh, the black and white photography by mm. the uh, director of photography Gilbert Taylor, mm. um, which, as we said, is just you know it's just very crisp and uh, no. stunning. Pretty, pretty superb. Yeah, very very stunning. Um, and I was you know looking up other movies that he uh, was director of photography on and one of those is star wars a new hope oh really uh, yes i had oh. no idea uh and he also did the the omen and so you know some other big movies so uh very mm-hmm. much just deserved for him yeah i think that it's interesting too just examining kind of the cultural impact and and the fallout mm-hmm. um from a movie like hard day's night because obviously it was important in establishing who the beatles were but i think this is a, this is kind of i mean what my dad would always say as the huge beatles fan is he said, in his recollection, the Beatles were what helped the United States get over Kennedy's death, hmm. uh, which I always thought was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And you could see how, um, you know, the, the Beatles, if, if you look at the way they were presented, is kind of still very fresh and modern. I mean, like, like mm-hmm. you look at like how Apple, you know, packages their products. Mm-hmm. There's definitely some relation to how the Beatles were shooting themselves that's shooting mm-hmm. themselves, but you know, but how they, how they were, <laughs> yeah. uh, how they were being shot at this time, how they were being filmed, how they were being presented, mm-hmm. um, and you know, it's been parodied countless times. Like uh, the it comes to my, scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like Austin Powers, literally mm-hmm. with the, uh, so so this opening scene for those of you who haven't seen the movie, but if if you haven't seen the movie, I would recommend going to watch it. It's it's currently on Filmstruck, actually. I don't know if anyone has oh. Filmstruck. Um, that's where I was able to find it. Yeah, I had um, the Criterion of this one actually, so I was able to just to. Oh, great. Pop it in, but yeah. Well, that an uh, even better way than Filmstruck. But that, <laughs> there, there's this opening scene where, you know, the, the Beatles are just being chased by these 
this massive crowd of screaming Legion of screaming uh, young women yeah. <laughs> and, and and they're all kind of like hiding behind newspapers and wearing mm-hmm. fake mustaches and it's something we've seen you know hundreds yeah. and hundreds of times and you, you know at least personally I'd always kind of wonder where that came from and you yeah. know and then of course it's the Beatles you know and then there are other other images too in this movie that just scattered throughout are just so deeply ingrained in mm-hmm. the culture I think that now we just take for granted because some of them have come become cliche and have been played out so many times. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the influence and the reach of this movie just cannot be understated enough. And truly, when you think of Beatlemania, you mm-hmm. think of that opening scene. You think of them running down the street with legions of fans coming after them. You know, it's just, it's just the first image that pops in your head, at least for me anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a, in a way, it does encapsulate that, that moment in time. Um, you know, and that opening is just so energetic and wild and it's it really is iconic i think that mm-hmm. opening um but you know it does keep it up from there i i would say the whole film is is kind of in that vein that just like i said very playful um that's something i want to talk about a little bit just how playful it is mm-hmm. uh you know whether it's john lennon playing around in a bathtub or george <laughs> harrison pretending to shave foam off someone's face in the mirror it's my favorite image of the whole movie oh yeah that's I, yeah, I that. one of mine too as well uh, yeah. and uh i love the part we, we mentioned it i think briefly but the bizarre, like nonsensical answers they give to reporters um, during that kind of like little montage part, mm-hmm. um, playing around in like a field on their lunch break, <laughs> just mm-hmm. stuff like that. It's just like the director and the bandmates, like they seem to be having, you know, such a good time and yeah. seem, well, seem to have approached it with, uh, you know, this this levity in mind. Yeah. Well, maybe the the most, in, in my opinion, you know, the most comical part of the whole movie is uh, is um, Paul's grandfather. There's, yeah, I love that part. <laughs> so so there, there's uh, Paul McCartney's grandfather. Uh, it's not his real grandfather. It's played by an actor uh-huh. by the name of... It's escaping me. Wilfred Brambell um, plays his grandfather named John McCartney. And little he's old man. <laughs> li- he's just this little old man, who's very clean, as they would say. Very clean, yes. Um, but he, he's just this troublemaker. He constantly is just getting... Uh, under everyone's skin and getting and getting them all caught up in these problems, um, but he's hysterical. He this one moment sticks with me where he ends up in a police station with Ringo, and he hasn't done anything wrong. He, he's just they, they just they brought they brought this old man in for his own safety, and he's trying to come up with a plan for how to get out. Yep. And he's just like talking out the side of his mouth at Ringo, and Ringo just <laughs> has no clue what's going. It, it's just it's it's just so funny and, and yeah. quirky and clever. It is very uh, funny, and it's funny because the movie starts off that way. I mean, other than that opening scene, the mm-hmm. very first scene of dialogue on the train is is about the who's that old man, you know? Who's that old man? Uh, and it just kind of goes from there, and it's just like very fast paced dialogue, very quippy back and forth. It kind of reminds me of like the Marx Brothers, like that kind mm-hmm. of, or you know, Lauren Hardy or something like that, where it's just like very, very quick and very. Yeah. Uh, it's almost verbal slapstick. Yeah, it you is. know, it's like it just is. just constantly joking anytime mm-hmm. there's an opportunity. But somehow it, it doesn't it doesn't feel played out. Maybe it's just because yeah. the jokes jokes are good. Um, well, yeah, it's that, and I think also at the same time it's it's giving you a good idea of their individual personalities mm-hmm. in a very you you know unique way. Um, so with that comedy and with that silliness, their personalities really shine through. Each one of the members, I feel like, kind of gets his moment to shine and. And then when they're all together, of course, as well. Um, did you get that kind of feeling, though, when you watched it? Yeah, I did. I thought it really brought out their personalities. For the first time, though, I actually considered the characters mm-hmm. that the Beatles here were playing the, for the right. first time watching this movie most recently. Because what was interesting to me is they were playing these almost lewd... I mean, not playing. I think it's who they was, who they were, not who yeah. they was. These kind of lewd... Uh, you know, troublemaking guys. But then you listen to the songs, and they're all like, "I want to hold your hand," <laughs> right, yeah. and I love her. They're they're these very yeah. endear, which is kind of interesting if you think about just how they're presenting themselves yeah. um, versus who they actually were, and, and mm-hmm. this this almost like cognitive dissonance where they could be so sweet and lovely to in in their songs, and they're just so endearing, mm-hmm. and then they get you know you'd see them in real life, or at least in the film version of. I mean, I assume this is what they were actually like. And they would just make these dirty jokes to everyone. There was kind of nothing sacred. Um, That's that's a good point. And it actually brings up a big, uh, a main topic that I wanted to ask you about for Mm -hmm. this film. Um, Do you think this film is the Beatles as they see themselves or as others see them or as they think others see them or neither? I mean, do you think it's a complete fabrication? 
I see. I think it's maybe a blending of the two, which which I mean is well done. I, I think probably one of the reasons why this holds up so well, and it's so fun to watch, is that it feels it like extremely honest. It, it doesn't. It, it to me at least, it doesn't feel like a fabrication. They're not presenting um, themselves in like the best light, basically. No, exactly. Yeah. yeah, like they're they're acting like a couple of. I mean, at this point, what year? Nineteen sixty four. I don't know. I'll look up. Like Paul McCartney had to be probably twenty. Mm-hmm. You know, twenty <laughs> twenty two years old. They're acting he's, like he's what they kid. are: a bunch of young kids who yeah. are in a, the biggest band in the world and are having yeah, fun. Who have know? free reign. Um, right. But so I think that like the the image we get of them on stage singing you know, wearing the suits with their nice haircuts. Like, that's the image that had probably previously been presented to the world. And I think that... Ed Sullivan Show and all that. Yeah, Ed Sullivan Show. And then I think that what we saw the rest of the film is maybe more who they were and who they would become. If you look at the the career of the Beatles as it went on, you know, mm-hmm. they, they did get into some more dangerous territory with the drugs. Right. Um, they, it became very political. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty, pretty radical. And, and I think you can kind of see little glimpses of that um, early on. Definitely. Um, um, yeah, and, and like you alluded to, obviously the Beatles would go on to make films such as Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow mm-hmm. Submarine, and I imagine we'll circle back to those films at some point to discuss those, but, you know, seeing as this is the first, you know, the band's first foray into film, you can definitely see the beginnings of their respective qualities and fascinations and, and just, you know, like all that surrealistic kind of imagery that we talked about and the way scenes play out and and mm-hmm. how they like to play around with the idea of making a movie, essentially. Because that's what this is to me at the end of the day. It's it's almost like, hey, we're making a movie. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like they're giving us free reign, like you said, uh, you know, to make this movie. And uh, this is what we're going to do with it. And in some ways, it's very rebellious and very much in the face of uh, the studio executives, I feel like. But I'm mm-hmm. sure they went along with it because they're like, well, it's the Beatles. So we're yeah. going to make money from this regardless, <laughs> you know, and which they did. Um, but I think the Beatles were just looking at what movies all are what they can do and mm-hmm. kind of saying hey this is our take on on what we can do with the movie you know yeah which i think is an interesting thing to bring up because if you look at what happened not long after this movie um i mean a you had easy rider which was a, a huge milestone that kind of popped up just mm-hmm. uh four or five years five years after this um which is another thing that kind of put youth culture at the front of cinema mm-hmm. um because it is interesting because after this came out it didn't seem like there was that huge swing right away, even though that this yeah. was a huge success. It seemed like it still took a little while. But then, you know, after that, in another, what was this, 64 or so, you know, another 16, 17, 18 years, MTV came about. And, and MTV was basically, just if you think about it, the, the music video is kind of derived from A Hard Day's Night kind yeah, of film. Yeah. Be- because in A Hard Day's Night, what was, what was kind of interesting is because obviously, you know, you think of the musical. Like one thing I kept thinking of during this movie, oddly enough, was uh, Singing in the Rain. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it's like, you know, the classic, the, it's the backstage musical. And th- that's what this movie basically was. But what was kind of different about this compared to uh, those, those a lot of the Gene Kelly musicals of, of the 50s is that the music actually seemed kind of less interwoven into the story. Like if you watch a Singing in the Rain, the story takes forefront no matter what. Whereas in A Hard Day's Night, they literally just at some points will break and just play a song, (laughs) even if it has nothing to do with it, just because there's that joy of watching this unbelievable band Mm -hmm. play their music and just listen to it. And another reason for that might be because, you know, a lot of films we've discussed so far on this podcast, you know, narrative, a plot, in other words, has not been the main focus. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I feel, especially with this film, uh, Mm -hmm. the plot is maybe... No, it, I would say definitely the least important part of it. Um, mm-hmm. It's really just about, you know, what's going on with each, you know, with the band and each member and getting to know them a little better and the different situations that they get put in. But mm-hmm. I don't think that, you know, and the reason you say, you know, something like Singing in the Rain, I mean, that's a narrative film mm-hmm. um, and the songs help the plot move along like most musicals. Um, but with this, yeah, it's more like, hey, we're a band, so we're going to play some songs. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether or not they were forced into that or if they wanted to include those songs, I actually don't. I'm not sure of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would assume they, they do because, you know, you assume it they helps. were they wanted well, to. Uh, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, it, ultimately they're a band first. And yeah, right. so you you got to assume a, a movie probably helps them, mm-hmm. you know, sell their records and play big mm-hmm. shows and, you know. 
I guess I wonder if it's one of those things that they were fighting back against, you know, because mm -hmm. like I said, this movie is so rebellious and I wonder if that was an aspect that they were, uh, mm -hmm. that they were against in any way. But I guess because they felt like they were in good hands with uh, Richard Lester, I felt like yeah. they were, they were more open to it in other words. But, yeah. Um, well, it might've been, that might've also kind of been a thing where they might've been kind of fighting back against it, but it does seem like if they were fighting back against it, they were winning the fight. Yeah. And rather than being spiteful and not putting effort in, it's it seems like maybe they just decided they were going to fight back by just doing it their own way mm -hmm. and having fun with it by just being silly, <laughs> just yeah. being yeah, by just being silly and playful. Mm -hmm. And because they're they're pretty good actors. I mean, surprisingly, yeah, like, they are. They really I be are. I believed every you know every <laughs> word. <laughs> they're very compelling for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it would you know it, going back to what we were saying about the the plot and what exactly goes on in the film. Um, yeah, I, it would have obviously been much easier, I think, to do just like a straight biopic, you know, or a music performance film, like we said. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do find it very interesting that instead, you know, the band and the director decide to like challenge that notion and go their own way with it. Um, and that's what that's what makes it stand out. And that's why I think, you know, it's worth talking about in the show, um, even though they would go on to more surreal underground films. I think this one, because it was their first film and their first, you know, mm -hmm. start the start of all this. I, I think it's important to talk about. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And we got to know what they look like. Which yeah, was, exactly. I mean, this I mean, was like this was the world meeting them, you know, other than like their albums like, that they had before and the albums newspapers. and like, you know, Ed Sullivan. I, I imagine Ed Sullivan's. Uh, the, the performance on there was before this. Yeah. Um, I would assume. Um, yeah. So this is like, but this is like, you know, I'm sure everyone, it was like an event, like everyone went to go see this movie. So, um, yeah. so uh, let's go into some specifics uh, with, mm -hmm. you know, some moments or scenes that stick out to us. Was there anything that you, that you want to talk about in regards to that or? Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the periphery stuff, like there was, there's one scene where uh, the police are chasing the band around and there's a, a guy robbing a car and they keep running okay. by him. And every time uh, the police run by him, he pretends he's not robbing the car. And eventually the police officer gets in the car and he ends up driving this police officer around. Um, <laughs> just a lot. I mean, there were a lot of those little get. There are just so many fun moments in this movie. It's like almost said, like a silent comedy in some parts like that. Yeah, you know? it, it really is. It's, it's so kind of slapstick, mm -hmm. but it, it never feels like obnoxious. So right. it, it, it avoids that, and maybe that's just because they could come back to the music and they didn't have to fill the entire time with these gags. Um, the, I mean, the language, too. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not thinking of it off the top of my head, but, you know, they, they, they were well-spoken young men. They, they, they used this pretty eloquent language mm -hmm. to tell these absurd jokes and... Lots you know, of as a, uh, witty, like one-off remarks, like the when the one <laughs> the one reporter asked Ringo, like, "Are you a mod or a rocker?" and he's like, "I'm a mocker." <laughs> I'm a mocker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mocker. There's there's, ton, there's just so many. It's it's just so loaded with with good moments and just really fresh original scenes. Like, there's nothing in this that mm -hmm. feels played out or or repeated. I love that scene when they're, you know, when they are talking to the reporters because it's like they're having fun with that whole idea of celebrity, you know, mm -hmm. and like it's like a version of what, you know, I, I guess most people would imagine their daily lives were, you know, would entail. Mm -hmm. But it's like this is our version of it. You know, this is what we want to present to the world about what we do every day. Yeah. So I find that interesting. Um and other like specific moments I really like is like the first musical number um, when they're on the train. Mm -hmm. They, they just start playing <laughs> playing yeah. the instruments on the train and uh i find that kind of like funny and interesting is like the first like musical number that you really that really gets the, the narrative going um yeah. and also uh there's one there's one aspect we talked about the photography a little bit um there's one part that really stands out to me i remember the first time i saw it um a little bit ago i it just stood out to me and the second time watching it it did again during the uh and i love her sequence during that musical number there's a, a part with a, the camera like rotates around uh, it rotates around Paul, Paul McCartney mm -hmm. and there's a light behind him and just the the effect that light has on his face with the and the image you know as, as the camera kind of goes around him uh, just focusing on his face there's something very like dreamlike about that that part and very beautiful yeah. um, that that's always kind of stood out to me. Well, and equally though, I, I think that see, see what's interesting is so I don't I don't know why today I keep going back to Scorsese, but uh, I've heard interviews where he talks Please about do. how <laughs> in raging in Raging Bull he mm -hmm. wanted to shoot every boxing scene differently, 
He, he didn't want them to, you know, because it's so easy. You're shooting boxing, you know, you just set it up, you shoot it the same way. And, but he really went to great lengths to shoot every scene differently. And I feel like what could be said about this movie is they shot every musical sequence differently. Each one felt like its own, you know, there's the there's the, the one in the field. Like, the, the way they're framed, they go everything from these real wide, you know, when they're out in this, this field running around playing to when they get inside uh, the venue at the end and they're playing to the crowd, you get shots from behind them, mm -hmm. you get tight clothes. Like, every time they played a song, it felt like it was its own unique visual style that was just really tied to that particular song, um, which is not, a, not an easy thing to do. You know, no. it's like you, you have four people playing the same instruments and somehow every time it feels like this distinct individual thing mm -hmm. that is, it's very much its own. And they, re they revisit each, so uh, each song, I believe at the end, don't they? Like towards the end where they, so yeah. they kind of, they show like a little bit of each, of each uh, performance. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you, you're a huge Beatle fan, right? You, mm -hmm. you grew up with them. You said your dad was a big fan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you want to like when you first saw this movie, maybe as when you were younger, um, was did this fit the image in your mind of what the Beatles would be like or what, what did you think? Um, I It's hard to say that because honestly, I got introduced to the Beatles at an age that I don't even remember being introduced. So when I you was know, seeing that, like I, I was probably watching this movie when I was two, three years old. So there was never like an aha moment for me like, oh, this is the Beatles. It was always just kind of like, oh, it's the Beatles. You know, it's, it's just something I kind of grew up with. I think it's maybe more surprising revisiting it as an adult now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's one of those bands yeah. that's always kind of just been there. You know, the Beatles yeah. have always been in the subconscious of, you know, mainstream yeah. pop culture. So um, I totally understand that. Yeah. Well, it's um, like we were saying, you know, everyone knows there's everyone knows the song somehow. Yeah. But it's like you, you talk to people, they don't know much, if anything, about yeah. the Beatles. Yeah, but we were for some about reason, that, right? yeah, a, a song comes on the radio and every, everyone knows every word mm -hmm. just because they're so deeply ingrained into, you know, pop popular culture at this point. It's weird. Yeah, it's like it's almost like the Beatles have, you know, everyone's a fan, but also no one's a fan. No one's like yeah. a real fan almost. Except for know? the people who are like really fans. Right. Except. For, yeah. <laughs> except for like the yeah, the mm -hmm. really uh, enthusiastic ones. Yeah, but I can tell you like the third track on, you know. <laughs> yeah Let it be <laughs> oh yeah they do exist but i'm but for the mm -hmm. most part i think as you were saying um yeah it's they're kind of just you know they're just there they're just uh part of the fabric of, of you know mm -hmm. of pop culture so um yeah. and that's why i think this film is is just so interesting um you know that's one of the reasons anyway um and also hey it looks pretty damn good uh, yeah. like we said it's uh it's very nice to look at <laughs> um, very clean very clean <laughs> much very like clean. the old man <laughs> yes <laughs> um and uh, final takes on it, um, I was just going to say, you know, A Hard Day's Night, it may not be the most mind-blowing or innovative of cult films, mm -hmm. uh, but it has its own unique charm and sensibilities, and um, I think that counts for a lot. Um, and as I said, you know, the Beatles, they could have made something much more straightforward. They could have, mm -hmm. but, you know, they, they opted for a more creative and humorous approach, and, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. Um, makes it much more unique. Um and so what what were your final thoughts on, uh, on a hard uh, day's night? Yeah, I mean, like we've kind of already gone, like very innovative, you know, holds up really nicely today, even better than I kind of thought it would going into mm. it. It's um, breezy. It, it's a very breezy movie. It's breezy. It's yeah. fun. It's just an, an, an enjoyable watch that's super engaging. Like even even though there's not much plot, you don't want to look away. Mm. Um, and I would say anyone that's a, a Beatles fan um, or anyone that is you know, a movie lover, a film fan. Yeah. Yeah. A film fan is, is worth it watching this because you'll take something new and exciting from it. And you can actually watch this one with the family. That's another thing. That's some, yeah. That's some true. of the movies we discuss on here. You can't do that, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. this one, you know, there's no gore or guts yeah. or anything. Show it like to that. the kids, show it to the yeah. wife, grandma, grandpa, well, grandma and grandpa have probably already seen it, but bring your yeah. little old man, make sure he's clean. Yeah. <laughs> and show him a hard day's night. Exactly. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, director Richard Lester, he did go on to collaborate with the Beatles once again, uh, very soon after this on Help, which was the next film that they made. Um, and that was the very next year in 1965. 
Um, I have yet to see this, but it sounds very interesting and entertaining, uh, judging the, from the plot. So uh, it sounds worth checking out. You said you have seen it before, though, right, Jeremy? A very long time ago. A very long time ago. Okay. Yeah, I'd like maybe to revisit can, uh, it. Yeah. yeah, maybe we can revisit that one as well sometime. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's that's uh, A Hard Day's Night. Definitely worth checking out, I think. And um, this has been the first part of our series, Rock and Real Cult Music Films of the 60s and 70s. Uh, thank you for listening to Cult Movie Cult. You can find us on iTunes and Podbean, as well as on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you have any cult films you'd like to hear us discuss on the show, please feel free to reach out to us at cultmoviecult at gmail.com. And join us next time. We'll be diving into our next film in the series and talk about Surrealistic. The Monkees, uh, 1968's psychedelic epic, Head. This has been Cult Movie Cult, and until next time, so long from the other side.